Hello, I'm Chris Delneon of Gam Keto. I'm going to talk about three different things. The first of those is that Unity is often our best fit as a platform for small teams, solo developers, part-time developers. Unity is great, but it's often not the best place to start. Or even if you did start there, there are advantages to taking a step back and doing some programming outside of an engine, outside of any sort of frameworks like that. We'll talk more about that in a second. The second thing I'm going to talk about is the value of making covers of classic games you like, right? I mean, of, of remaking simpler, older games as a way of familiarizing yourself with fundamentals. We'll talk a bit more about that in a second. And then the third point is to code in a way appropriate for your scale, which is to say that unless you're a full team of full-time professionals working 40 hours a week plus, then you don't necessarily program the same way for your games. If all you have are a few hours here and there, there's different practices and trade-offs that we have to make as developers in order to still produce the kind of games that we are complex enough for us to be interested in. So let's go back through those in a little more detail. The first bit about, like I said, Unity is more often than not a strong target, a strong fit for solo or small team developers, especially one on a limited budget. Unreal is incredibly powerful, but more often than not, unless it's a team of ex-professional Unreal developers, I've not seen a lot of small teams produce the same kind of yield or throughput. The only the issue is that Unreal is great for people who are much more specialized, whereas for in the Unity case, a lot of us are wearing many hats. We're rapidly switching between the design work, the coding work, uh, some of the asset integrations, some of the asset work included. Unity is great for that kind of stuff and really a good accelerator for small teams. And meanwhile, the kind of power that Unreal gives us, we kind of lack the deep specialization necessary to leverage in a way that scales across the whole game for many small teams. That's obviously the two major ones. Lumberyard has come up. It's basically the Crytek engine with some other integrations. Crytek has never been the right answer for small teams, so I'm not going to talk about Lumberyard. Now, what I will say, and, and sort of the point to this, though, is that if someone goes straight into Unity, there's all these gaps and pretty fundamental things in what Unity is doing for them, which is great if you already know how it's doing those things. But a lot of people leveraging Unity to, good, to, get, to get good results have done some sort of background before in non-Unity game programming. So C Sharp with XNA or Monogame or C++ and SDL or Allegro or uh, Python and Pygame or uh, even Lua 2D kind of frameworks and stuff where it's much more code-driven gameplay. And what that results in is, uh, I think, an important understanding about how code uh, operates things like motion, display, input handling, collision detection in the most fundamental level and these are things that not only is, it's not just like enriching to understand how Unity is doing what it's doing. It's really useful from a practical standpoint to be able to go in there and rewrite or override or do your own way certain aspects of how your game works so it feels and looks different in how it behaves in your game than from the other default pile of Unity games out there of things that are very easy or natural to make with Unity, like a pile of rigid bodies just doing what rigid bodies do. This is something that it's also a bit like why we can't just take a graphing calculator, hand it to a child, and drop them into Algebra 2. There are too many fundamental gaps. They need to know what it's doing for them to better make use of its power. One of the easiest examples I can kind of hang on to for this is, is so in Unity, gravity is a checkbox and a number you can tune. But for about 30, 40 years of platformer games, the real distinguishing characteristic of what made them play so differently from one another is actually kind of how gravity was implemented in those games. What happened when you let go of the jump button in the air? What happened in terms of air control? What happened when a projectile hit you in the air in terms of its collisions relationship to your fall or your vertical momentum, etc.? These are all nuances that it's useful to have an eye for that you might lack if you go straight to Unity and checkbox. And this isn't just hypothetical. This is from working one-on-one -on -one with people and in club settings and seeing that many people get stuck early on unless we take a step back and look first at, okay, let's build something else in some other platform. My platform of choice for that has more recently been HTML5 JavaScript on Canvas. I specify on Canvas because we're not using libraries like Phaser or any of those other kind of things. Those are great libraries for more advanced 2D developers. But when you're a beginner, we really want to focus on just dealing with shapes and motion and being responsible for if you have a sprite sheet even to animate, that you're learning how to write at least basic code to do that. Second thing, tied into that one in terms of how I teach it, is to not be afraid to do what I'm calling covers in like a musical sense of classics when you're new to game development. And this is something which in the commercial industry we know is cloning and is obviously frowned upon. I'm not suggesting you should go take someone else's game, make your own variation of it, and then try to rip off their sales, beat them to some other platform. That's not what this is about at all. What this is about is that it's in the same way that if someone's starting to learn an instrument, 
they're not simultaneously trying to write original music on it. Right? When someone's trying to learn voice skills as a singer, they're not simultaneously trying to write their own material. They're first playing music or singing music that has been well understood for generations. Simple classics that allows us to do the Mary Had a Little Lamb kind of thing. We see the same thing in the kitchen where, you know, you're not trying to learn your way around what's a pinch and how do I operate the oven at the same time as inventing your own recipe. First, you're trying to make a good lasagna or a good macaroni and cheese by following a recipe. And as you get experience through more and more projects, then as you go along, you can add more of your own innovation, your own twist, your own style, your own voice. Maybe start remixing for multiple pieces of other kind of ideas that you see outside. And that's where you start to find your own original voice in it, but with some traction and foundations and conventions that are understood, that have stood the test of time, that have pushed you to learn skills outside of what came most easily or most naturally in the platform that you're working on. Technical fluency is a lot easier to develop in these known domains, even if your target is more experimental or weird stuff. It can still be really beneficial to start in, can I draw, can I, can I work on these more basic forms? Lots of people who go on to do highly abstract, highly conceptual, very interesting experimental visual artwork still at some point probably took some proper technique training in human anatomy or in various forms of sketching and different types of medium uh, in order to better understand the basics so they could do more advanced work on top of it. It's not like we just skip that stuff and go straight to doing weird things. Or if we do, we very quickly hit a ceiling and it more often than not kind of resembles a lot of other weird things people jump straight to, like I say, doing whatever is easiest in that platform that they might do it in. And then lastly, the third point I want to talk about is to code in a way that's appropriate to your scale. And like I said earlier, what that means fundamentally is if you are not a giant company of people, then you can't program as if you're on a giant company of people. There's different obligations and constraints in that kind of environment that if you write too much sloppy, sloppy hacky code in that kind of setting, nothing's going to get done. People can't collaborate with you. If you're working alone, you have to make some trade-offs. And it's always a hard thing for people who are conventionally or traditionally trained in software engineering or in programming, or especially if their day job is in programming of a sophisticated, scalable nature, like backends or compilers or operating systems or other highly sophisticated, important and valuable software gets built this way, including many AAA games have to be. But at the small scale, when all we have is a few hours here and there to squeeze in between the weeks or for students between classes, those are things that we have to find ways to do uh, in terms of optimizing our time as the programmers rather than worrying about how do we write the most elegant architected code possible. Among especially beginning programmers, beginning game developers, I've seen far more people get derailed and lost and demoralized from worrying too much too early about trying to optimize their code or worrying about trying to perfectly architect and plan out their software than I've ever seen from people writing some non-performant code which is usually not an issue on a modern computer for simple games, or from a lack of program planning, which for a small enough game isn't necessarily that useful. Instead, what I encourage, instead of trying to worry about this thing from dogmatic of what's the right way to do it, what's the perfect and correct way to do it, do whatever works. Do what gets the game working and together and going. And what you're going to see through experience as your projects get incrementally more and more complicated is you'll begin to have practical, solid reasons for certain kinds of organization in your code because it's going to help you. Because then and there, you cross a threshold where you're going to see how it benefits that it helps you bring your work to another level. If you try to do that stuff on a tiny project, you could spend months doing stuff that frankly ought to take you days or less. And it's, it's useful for your own understanding, even if you're going to move on to bigger projects, to work in a studio, etc., to be able to see where that line is. So if you're rapid prototyping, you can make a more informed choice about when you should do the more architected, planned kind of approach and a little more careful in terms of documentation and so on, as opposed to the Let's just get this working so we can decide if it's worth keeping, so we can decide if we need to rip it out or spend more time doing it the right way. Prototyping is a very real part of game development, so there's lots of things that a computer can do that we can then try and form an opinion on that our brains aren't such good emulators for. So useful skill is to be able to, to code in a format appropriate to your scale. If you're working alone, if you're on a small team, you can't be too critical of yourself in writing the same kind of code that maybe, like I say, for a day job might not be as appropriate, especially when you're starting out especially when you're getting started. Just focus on just get the game working. So once again, that is Unity is often not the best fit for your first environment. Uh, or if you jump straight to it, I encourage, go outside of there, do some gameplay programming in some other format. Now, I'm not going to say to the extent of you don't need to worry about manual memory management anymore for a small kind of game. Lots of people are getting away with delaying that until very advanced optimization considerations. Uh, but so like I say, I, I've been teaching with HTML5, JavaScript, Canvas for that. It's been working out great. I used to teach that with processing. Uh, there's lots of options for that, but something outside the domain I think could be useful to supplement and enrich your understanding of Unity 
or whatever engine you may choose, uh, to not be afraid to do covers of classics. It's not commercial cloning. It's not ripping anybody off. It is really, it's practicing the fundamentals to better understand what you're doing and how it all fits together. And, and what are the conventions that you can learn so you have a foundation to build upon, even if you move on to unconventional and more experimental, ex more experimental work. And then lastly, to code in a way appropriate to your scale. So, uh, you know, basically hack and don't feel bad about it, especially when you're starting out. So that's it for me. Uh, if you want to see, uh, I've got some, I've got some video courses that how to follow this approach, this philosophy at codeyourfirstgame.com. Uh, you can get there with or without the hyphens codeyourfirstgame.com. Takes just a few hours, helps kind of show you this approach I'm talking about as a foundation. Uh, helps help at this point, lots of people get started. So hopefully I've used to some of y'all out there and best of luck to you in the future. I look forward to playing your games. All right, and one more quick point. Uh, learn to make your own placeholder art and audio assets. And when I say placeholder, I really mean placeholder. I mean like, can I tell that that's a chair and that's a helicopter? And if you can, move on, right? And I'm not saying everyone out there needs to go to art school, become an artist, take a bunch of courses and becoming skilled in it. What I am saying is don't go out there and just find a kit that has a bunch of art already in it. Don't go finding art bundles. Don't go, don't go buying them on the asset store. Uh, or you wind up reverse designing your games around whatever art you can find. And what's going to unlock your skills as a game developer is that when you have an idea for something that ought to be in your game, you can represent it in a way that people can tell what it is. You can move forward with the design. And I'll tell you what, if the mechanics ever get to a point where people find it really fun to play, you can tell you're really onto something. Uh, maybe it's getting festival review responses. Maybe it's getting outside traction on YouTube, etc. Whatever it might be. Uh, at that point, it's easier to justify spending more time and energy on find a skilled artist collaborator, maybe commission art, etc. But before that point, just get practice at making your own placeholder art assets, 2D and 3D. Uh, like I say, just a level of recognizability. Uh, and likewise for sound effects, don't go out your way to find professional quality sounds and stuff. Waste the time and money early on. Make sounds that work. Find sounds that work that are obviously have a license to use. Uh, but I just want to emphasize that of, of get comfortable making placeholder assets because that's going to really unlock your potential for your own original ideas down the line.